welcome back. I've been promising an update on the HP 158 oscilloscope for about three weeks now, and unfortunately, uh, this episode isn't that. <laughs> um, it's not that I haven't been working on the scope, Believe me, I have been. For the last three weeks, I've just been pouring all of my free time into that scope, trying to crack it. And every time I think I find the piece that's gonna fix the entire thing, I change that component out and it's sometimes worse. Uh, so it's just been absolutely kicking my butt. Uh, but I think I've finally found the smoking gun on it. Uh, as a matter of fact, some component in there looks like it actually went up in smoke long before I got my hands on the scope itself. Uh, so I'm hopeful that replacing that part will bring the scope back into proper life. Uh, but that part's not gonna be here for another two days. I had to order it. So I'm at this weird impasse on the scope. I can't proceed any further until that part gets here, but I don't wanna sit around doing nothing for two days. So much like the uh, TI-2500 data math calculator that we worked on a couple episodes back, I have a ton of smaller projects that I would also like to tackle, uh, but I, I don't want to prioritize them over the big projects. And so I needed something that I could maybe spend a day or two on, and then whenever the part for the HP scope gets here, I can set back down, or I can say, hey, it's finished, and then I can get back to work on the scope. Uh, but all, what all of this means is that today we're doing a slightly different project than the HP scope. And so uh, what we're gonna do today is we're gonna look at a really unique piece that a member on my Discord server posted pictures of. Uh, Audrey posted these awesome photos of this really weird looking vacuum tube integrated circuit thing that looked like it was built entirely onto a single base. And uh, she said, I have no idea what this is, uh, but I was absolutely fascinated by it. So I just begged Audrey and just said, please send it to me. I'll send it back in one piece, I promise, but I wanna know what it is. I gotta know what it is. I'm going nuts not knowing what it is. And so uh, I finally convinced Audrey to uh, put it in the mail and ship it this way. And well, here it is. Uh, it's not a very big piece, but it has a whole lot going on inside of it. The uh, population density of this little thing is insane. Uh, and like Audrey, I have absolutely no clue what it's supposed to do. Uh, so that's hopefully what we can figure out today. I don't really know. What I'm gonna try and do is uh, trace out where all of the uh, connections are on this, maybe make a schematic, and then maybe I can make a couple of guesses as to what it might do, I don't know, but uh, I think it's gonna be fun trying to reverse engineer this thing a little bit. So let's hop over to the bench, we'll take a look at it in detail, and then I'll get to tracing out the schematic for it. All right, here it is, we got a little bit of a closer look at it now, uh, and well, you can see that it is seriously dense. There are resistors, there's a little mystery component over here, a capacitor here, and there are three tiny little sub-miniature vacuum tubes right here. Uh, and it's all on an 11-pin base. Uh, but the diameter of this base, despite the fact that it has 11 pins, is about the same diameter as a regular old octal tube. As a matter of fact, the whole thing is no bigger than a single octal tube. So you can see here, this is a uh, 6AU5, I believe. Uh, yeah, this is a 6AU5 GT. Uh, this is actually out of the HP scope. Uh, and you can see that the entire thing could fit within the same volume as this single octal tube. And this isn't even a very big octal tube. This is a relatively small one. But if we look a little closer at this one, uh, well, you can see that <laughs> there is so much more in that tiny little space, as opposed to having like a single pentode, uh, we have three individual pentodes with a whole lot of supporting circuitry. Uh, and so there's just, uh, I'm just fascinated with it. I'm also really curious why there are these two extra leads that seem to come up from the top. One of them is coming directly out of the uh, resistors, just like the uh, leg of this resistor didn't connect anything. 
Uh, but before we start tracing the circuit out, I think I need to learn a little more about these sub-miniature pentodes that are on here because I have never had a sub-mini tube in my collection. So let's pull the data sheet out for those right quick. So the three sub-miniature pentodes that are being used on this uh, mystery piece are CK502AX type pentodes, and this is the data sheet for them. Uh, and uh, well, when I say data sheet, I literally mean sheet. It's just one piece of paper. Uh, most data sheets have a whole lot more information on them, but this one is a little sparse. However, there's a lot of interesting things that we can glean from this right off the bat. The first is, is that these sub mini pentodes are only five pins. And five pins for a pentode seems a little small, considering that the uh, 6AU6 that we use on uh, pretty much everything else that we're doing uh, is a seven pin pentode. And so only having five pins means that the inside of this is constructed a little differently. And so it actually defines what those pins are right here. It says uh, pin number one is the plate, Pin number two is grid number two. Pin number three is the filament negative side. Pin number four is grid number one. And pin number five is the filament positive side. Uh, now you'll notice that there are two things missing from this. There is a cathode missing and there is a suppressor grid missing. And well, the cathode isn't actually missing. The filament is the cathode. And then the suppressor grid, which can also be called grid number three, we have a little note for it at the bottom, and it says grid number three is composed of two deflector plates, one being connected to lead three and the other to lead five. Now the filament itself is a purely DC filament. It needs to be at 1.25 volts, and it draws just 30 milliamps. Um, this is uh, pretty wild compared to like a 6AU6, which is a 6.3 volt filament that it draws 300 milliamps. So this sub mini tube is very, very low power. And then if we look at the plate voltage, we can see that the maximum rating for the plate voltage is 45 volts. So this entire thing is meant to run probably at around 20 to 30 volts. So the low plate voltage and the low filament voltage and filament current means that this tube was perfect for very small lightweight battery powered devices. And actually, if we do a little bit of research on the CK502AX, uh, we'll see that it was originally built by Raytheon for use in vacuum tube hearing aid devices. This was the tube that allowed electronic hearing aids to become portable. That's really cool. However, I do not believe that the mystery unit we have here has anything to do with hearing aids at all. Uh, but I'm not ruling it out because it is a complete and total mystery to me. Uh, so in order to solve that mystery, I'm gonna hunker down and try to draw out as much of the schematic as possible just by looking at it. And maybe we can start to figure out what this thing is meant to do. I think we're getting somewhere. Uh, as you saw in the time lapse, I came up with uh, this kind of quick and dirty schematic. Now with the schematic laid out like this, it was really difficult to see what was going on. So based on this, I came up with a new schematic. Now, unfortunately, I was hoping to power this thing up, uh, but I don't think that's going to be possible. Um, there's a couple of reasons that we're not going to be able to do that. The first is that uh, once I was able to peel this tube kind of out of the way, I could get a look at the pins of this tube. Uh, 
and even though I didn't move this tube out of the way, I could see uh, that pin number three was broken off right at the glass. Uh, so if I wanted to put power into this, I would have to desolder this tube and replace it. Uh, the other issue is that um, these two 82 ohm uh, resistors here, I, they don't measure with any resistance at all. They measure totally open. Um, but even further than that, there's so much that I think is happening off circuit that I wouldn't even actually know how to go about powering it up. Uh, which leads me to the unfortunate conclusion that I still don't have a clue what this thing is supposed to do. Uh, but I can kind of get an idea of how it's doing whatever it is that it's supposed to do. Now there's a couple things that are really obvious in this schematic. Uh, the first is that the screen grid is tied directly to the plate and that is for all three tubes. Um, interestingly for uh, all three of these, I think that kind of forces the tube to operate in a bit of a triode strapped mode. <laughs> which is really an interesting choice here, uh, particularly for tube R1, which has a uh, 150,000 ohm plate resistor coming into it. And speaking of R1 and L1, we can see that this is really a pretty simple amplifier combination. Pin five of both of these are tied together, and I'm assuming that these go to a 1.25 volt input, and then pin three of both of these are tied together, and I'm assuming that these go to ground. So that's going to be the power for our filament and the grounding of the cathode. Now tube R1 has a 150,000 ohm plate resistor, and that should give quite a lot of gain. Uh, and then whatever the output of R1 is, is going to be going through a one nanofarad coupling capacitor to the grid of tube L1. Uh, now what's interesting is that uh, the biasing is done completely off circuit. So the grid of L1 is connected to the one nanofarad and it's connected to pin six of our socket. Now another interesting thing to note is that L1 does not have a plate resistor, uh, but it also doesn't have a cathode resistor, so it must have a plate resistor of some kind that is off circuit through pin 7 of our base. Now the one nanofarad coupling capacitor between the two tells us that pretty much this circuit only cares about AC signals and fairly high frequency AC signals at that. So this is pure speculation, uh, but it could be that uh, tube R1 is used for amplification and then tube L1 is used for level shifting of some kind. Um, that's the only logical sense that I can make of having the uh, plate resistor offloaded off the circuit. Now what is R1 amplifying? Well, that's where it gets really kind of confusing with the tube M1. First and foremost, I believe we can ignore the 160K, 330K, and 8K voltage divider that's going on here. I have question marks on these components because I couldn't quite tell what they were, but I measured them with my multimeter and that those were the values that they came up with. Um, but most importantly, it looks like they're coming from B plus and they're going straight to the cathode. And so I don't think that these are going to have any effect on the rest of the circuit. And actually, uh, given that they connect up to pin 10 and pin one at the two different stages of our voltage divider there, I think these are providing an output for another part of the system. And that output is going to change a bit based on the value of the cathode because tube M1 is set up as a cathode follower, which means that the cathode is going to change value depending on what the input is. And the input into the grid comes in through S8. And I have absolutely no idea what that input is supposed to be. We can see that pin three of the filament goes to pin nine of our base, and then pin five of the filament goes through a 22,000 ohm resistor, and then I believe a 20 nanofarad capacitor. This was the uh, little black mystery component. My multimeter measured it as 20 nanofarads, but it could be anything. Uh, but it looks like it's going through the 22,000 ohm with the 20 nanofarad and then another 22,000 ohm to ground. Um, and then in parallel to that, we have a 33,000 ohm resistor to ground. So the two 82 ohm resistors that we're seeing in series here are one of the long whiskers that are coming off the top. And I believe that this is designed to pick up very high frequency, very, very low voltage uh, AC signals that are in the airwaves essentially. And it connects to the center point of our 1.2 and 8.2 mega ohm resistor uh, divider network here. Uh, and then it goes all the way over to the grid of R1. 
Now here's where it gets really interesting because based on the control grid of tube M1, the value of the cathode is going to change. And as the value of that cathode increases, our voltage divider network is going to change as well, which is going to give the signal coming out of the center of that voltage divider a different bias based upon the value of the cathode of the cathode follower M1 here. So all in all, I think it is an absolutely fantastic little device. I want to thank Audrey again for sending this to me. It is very, very cool. I still have absolutely no clue what it does, uh, but we have a much better idea of what it is capable of doing. Um, so if you have any insight, uh, please leave a comment below or even better, hop over to the Discord and let us know directly that way. The Discord is an excellent place to get in direct contact with me, uh, but also it's full of a ton of really brilliant people uh, that are all just sharing cool old electronic stuff. But I think that's about all I can manage with this little unit. So I want to thank you guys so much for watching and I hope to see you in the next episode.